James uh, Turner, JD, is an original Nader's Raider and partner since 1973 in the Washington, D.C. law firm of Swankin and Turner. He served as consumer affairs consultant to Governor John Gilligan of, of Ohio, special counsel to the U.S. Senate Select Committee on Nutrition and Human Needs, and the Government Operations Subcommittee on Government Research. He graduated from Ohio State University with a Bachelor in History and Political Science in 1962 and the Ohio State University Moritz College of Law in 1969. Please welcome to the podium James, James Turner. Thank you very much. Test one, two, three, test one, two, three. Okay, does that work now? Okay. All right. All right, once again, thank you for this opportunity to be here and talk a bit about. Uh, what I put in the title of the talk, uh, Vaccines, Mercury, and, uh, and the Suppression of Natural Food. That's the pieces to it. And um, I'm kind of interested that I'm between Dr. Moskowitz on one hand and Dr. Haley on the other, vaccines, mercury, and I'm right here in the middle and then Rush Jaffe comes along later, uh, this first thing this afternoon. You know, all these are people that I've known for a long time and uh, whose work I've watched and admired. And it fits into a, the, the message that I want to present. In order to approach any of these discrete issues that we are discussing today and yesterday in this conference and every conference we go to and every day in our activities, I urge a strategic framework for examining the specific issues. In the big overview, I argue that the problems that exist in the vaccine area, in the mercury area, and the diet area, at the core are the same problems. They express themselves specifically in different ways, in unique ways, but generically, we have a system of thought that creates the framework that each of these issues follows or is contained within. Uh, there's a, an old joke about, uh, you know, God said to Moses, I have good news and bad news. The good news I'm going to part the Red Sea. The bad news is you're going to have to write the environmental impact statement. <laughs> it, it kind of illustrates the difference between reality and rules. We create a set of rules or a set of ideas or concepts that we try to impose on reality. <clears throat> the entire conversation or presentation we just heard is the presentation of real information, real facts, through the case studies and the information that was contained in them, and then a set of rules that the culture has evolved, which is the vaccine regimen. And we try to impose that on the natural reality, the core reality, the reality that people experience. There's our religious thinking, those get together as a set of codes that we, that we operate on, I like to sort of illustrate it by saying there's sort of a bedrock reality of natural, discoverable information. Then there is a set of beliefs that we have used to interpret how to look at that reality. 
That set of beliefs sort of mediates our whole way of thinking about what's real. And on top of that, there are a set of principles or policies or laws or rules that we utilize. And the best rules, the best codes, the best guides to activities are the ones that are most congruent with the bedrock reality. However, we mediate all of our rules through that set of beliefs that's in between reality and rules. And so we're constantly trying to conform what we believe, scientifically, religiously, legally, we're trying to conform that to a set of beliefs that we formulated here. And it comes from our culture, from our experience, from our activities, from what we read and so forth. And to a large extent in our culture today, there's a bigger separation between what the bedrock reality actually provides for us and the rules that we have than is good for our well-being. I illustrate the uh, idea of what goes on when we use science as our way of picking our way through these problems uh, by thinking of going into the attic with a flashlight. You go up in the attic and you got a flashlight. And the flashlight in this illustration or this metaphor is science. And you shine the flashlight on various things. And it's very powerful for helping you see that there's an old mannequin here or there's a notebook over there or there's a hat over there. And you shine your shi science on that and you see those things. That's all very valuable and very powerful. The mistake comes, and we do it all the time, when the following statement is made. And that is, if we haven't shined the light on it, and we don't see it, we treat it as if it's not there. So those things that are bumping up against you, or those intuitions you have, or all the stuff that you bring with you that you don't get the light to shine on, is excluded from the equation. Now, it has a very significant implication for the way we do public policy. And I, I want to talk about these issues that I, that I laid out as the title for the talk in the context of public policy, one of those sets of ideas that r rides up here above our beliefs, separated from bedrock reality. And start with the vaccine issue. I started out working with Ralph Nader in 1968 in Washington, and I did that after having spent a year studying Nader's writings and uh, speeches and so forth in law school as an assignment. The professor's argument was he created a thing called the Theato Safety Summit, and he had 15 students, and we each played a character. I was Ralph Nader, another guy was the president of General Motors, and another guy was the uh, uh, Senator Magnuson, who had been holding hearings on the issue, <clears throat> and the other 50, other 13 or 12 played other characters. When I read the Nader material, what really struck me is that Nader, this is 1966 and 7 when I was doing this, was seen publicly as an auto safety crusader. But when you read his professional writing, auto safety was an example of a general problem. The general problem was that our decisions were being made by large concentrated economic interests. They were not being made through a democratic process. And he said, you know, a little paragraph or so at the beginning of the discussion. This is a serious problem because we don't get <clears throat> congruent decisions when we do that. We don't get things that people are uh, supporting and are aware of and are, are knowledgeable about. We get something else. Let me give you an example of the automobile industry. And then he listed all of the things that were going on that were not in the consumer interest in cars. When I went to meet with him and talked to him, my point to him was that whatever he was saying about cars could be true in every other market if his analysis was correct. We kicked around what, to, uh, what would be the best way to illustrate this, and I finally said, suggested food, which I was interested in. And he said, I like this line, he said, food, that's great, we should do food, because I was a cook in the Army for six months. Now, there's a concept, Ralph Nader is a cook in the Army, <laughs> probably never heard before. <laughs> but we launched off and looked at the food industry and discovered that it was run essentially the same way that the auto industry was run. Auto's uh, leadership said you can't sell safety. Food leadership said you can't sell nutrition. Auto sold design, food sold convenience. And the reason they did that is that the design and convenience could put a nice 
markup on what was being sold. You buy eggs, flour, and the other things that you make a cake with at home, and it's a relatively, actually it's a, it's a negative return to a supermarket. You buy cake mix with all those things supposedly mixed into it, it works really well financially. When you look at the, so, so that kind of a system, we went and looked at FDA and had uh, a batch of students, uh, 25 of them, and worked with me for two years and pulled together the report, the Chemical Feast, the NADA report on food protection at the FDA. One day I'm working there and I get a call from John Gardner, the former Secretary of Health, Education and Welfare, as it was called in uh, the 60s, saying, I have learned since I left public office that there's something wrong in vaccine regulation. Would you be willing to look into it? Now, I, I start the story this way because I want you to understand how alienated we are as people from the processes that we're relying on to make our decisions. This is the guy that was in charge of vaccine regulation at the top of that whole enterprise. Something was wrong with vaccine regulation and I would like you to look into it. And he introduced me to a senior scientist at NIH at the time, because NIH regulated vaccines in the, that period of time. It was 1970. And uh, J. Anthony Morris. And uh, I began working with Morris. Morris had been involved in vaccine development at Walter Reed starting in 1942. And almost every leader of the vaccine world had gone through that Walter Reed program. These are the leaders in the 70s. And he was one of them. And the story that I learned by going with him to each vaccine regulator and each vaccine decision maker um, actually makes what you heard today seem tame. The person that was in charge of regulating DPT specifically said, it is the dirtiest thing that has ever been put into the human body. That's a quote from him. They felt their hands were tied in how to proceed because that vaccine was approved in the 1930s. And uh, the ability to get a new vaccine on the market was, it was not cost effective compared to just keeping the old one going, as, as far as the manufacturers are concerned. Burroughs Welcome at the time. So here we were in the 1970s with a vaccine that everybody knew, forget whether Forget the public outcry, forget what's going on in the public. Everybody as regulators knew it was not a good thing to be doing. And nothing was done about it. One of the people that was working with us in this campaign on vaccines was the guy that developed the chicken pox vaccine at work. And he left and became a protester about vaccines at that point. He was motivated to do this because his son got a rare illness and died at the age of 12. And he began thinking about what he was doing and said, I can't keep doing this work because this vaccine, the chickenpox vaccine, varicella vaccine, has got so many dangers in the laboratory that the very idea of putting it in people just sickens me. That was his position. And he worked with us very hard to present information that we pulled together about vaccines. And frankly, we went, to, we went through the entire vaccine list. And I'm talking about measuring them on the standards that the system uses for itself. None of them passed muster. Cholera vaccine spread cholera because it only addressed symptoms. Polio vaccine was in a huge debate between Sabin and Salk. Anyone know about that debate? I mean, they were fighting to the death over that killed versus live vaccine. I learned that, I mean, you may or may not remember this, but when the Salk vaccine came out in, 19, in 1955, about 100 people died from the vaccine and about 3,000 were paralyzed. And I learned that the uh, NIH regulator on uh, measles vaccine actually discovered that the vaccine was paralyzing monkeys before it was released to the public and tried to get that information into the decision-making process that was moving the vaccine toward use in public and was not able to do so because the track of getting it out to the public was already moving along. 
And when she tried to get it into that process, she wasn't heard. Now, you're, you'll hear, you'll look in the literature, and you'll see this, this great debate about the people who died from the Salk vaccine in 1955. And it'll say, well, it's a trade-off. We saved all these people from polio. There's a big debate about that issue, but that's a different kind of debate. And so a few people, 100 killed and 3,000 paralyzed, mostly for life, those people were just one of the unfortunate side effects of having created this great, wonderful new polio vaccine. The fact is that if they had taken 30 more days, that's how long it took them to clean the thing up once they found the people dying, on their own terms, if they'd taken 30 more days and followed the process that was in the law, nobody would have died for whatever the benefits were. And over and over did I find this going with going and meeting these people. I met Alexander Langmuir, who was the founder of CDC. He was a professor at Harvard. And he told me he'd been fired from his job because he refused to make the annual statement that everyone should get a flu shot. It was in 1962. He said, everyone shouldn't get the flu shot. I don't get the flu shot. He was about 75 at the time. I don't get the flu shot. He also pointed out that when the flu uh, vaccine first came along, Two of the most highly counterindicated groups for the vaccine were children and elderly. Why? Because they're more susceptible to the flu, so therefore they're more susceptible to the side effects of the flu vaccine. Now, I want to just be really clear. <coughs> this particular argument I just made is inside the paradigm. It's inside the vaccine paradigm. These are people who, using their own research and their own judgment and their own values, are aware that this problem that exists in vaccines is a real problem. This isn't coming from the outside and saying, look, it's not helping people, it's harming people, or whatever. This is saying, by your own internal standards, you're not providing people with a positive risk-benefit trade-off on what you're doing here. What you've got here is something that could be a much more useful and much better thing if you did it the way you're supposed to. I, I was very interested in hearing the reference to SIDS because right at the middle of this time there was a whole issue about vaccines being involved in SIDS. And that came up in our case because there was a scientist at, uh, at uh, the National Cancer Institute who happened to be a veterinarian. And he was there for a very specific reason. And that was that in the animal studies, particularly the monkey studies that the Cancer Institute was doing for cancer causes, the uh, monkeys were dying of SIDS. So they got a veterinarian in there to look at it and see what the problem was. And so he did. He came in, he looked at it, he worked on it, and he said, it's the vaccines. You can't give the vaccines to the monkeys because it kills them. So they stopped giving the vaccines to the monkeys and the monkeys didn't die anymore. And he scratched his head and he went to his boss, who was the head of the Cancer Institute, and said, hey, you know, this thing that worked on monkeys, maybe it'll work on people. We should look into it. The answer of the Cancer uh, Institute head was, that's not our problem. We look at cancer. We don't look at SIDS. And it got to be a big magilla. And I can remember, we had a meeting, the head of the Cancer Institute, this scientist and myself had a meeting to discuss all of this. Cancer Institute head said, can't do it because he's, this isn't our job. Our job's cancer, he's gotta go somewhere else. Go over to the Child Institute or something. And then he left. And then the Cancer Institute head gets to me aside and says, do you think he's really found the cure for AIDS? Do you think, is AIDS, do you think this is really what's causing it? And I'm saying to myself, there's a professional and a personal split there of real significance. It got driven home to me uh, about six weeks later, because at this point there was a big public outcry about SIDS going on. There were a lot of news and a lot of information and a lot of stuff. And, and um, big public outcry. And Congress got interested. So somebody in Congress sent a message over to the head of the National, Inst National Institute of Health, NIH, said, what have you got going on on SIDS research? Because we've got a real public outcry. We've got to put a program together. The National Cancer Institute head wrote, we've got a veterinarian doing research on SIDS over here, and we could use that $10 million. <laughs> it was real easy to put 
personal and pro uh, professional together when that was on the horizon. Now, I, I think that the process of thought which underlies this dynamic has some key points to it. And I think that whenever this group or I'm, I'm involved with a lot of other groups, Citizens for Health is one. You, know, you want to take a look at Citizens for Health, citizens.org. Um, uh, we style ourselves as the consumer voice of the natural health community and constantly are trying to get consumers' attention on various issues in the natural health world. But I think all of these social battles that are underway <clears throat> are shaped by a way that we think. Now, first of all, one piece of the way we think is we think dualistically. The entire regulatory process is built around a basic flaw, a fraud, a, a flawed idea. That flawed idea is that you can take reality, that Bates, that bedrock, and you can draw a line, and everything on this side of the line is good, and everything on this side of the line is bad. And then we send out a bunch of regulators who are really ultimately cops, armed with all kinds of legal authority, to go and enforce that line. If you're over here, you're good. If you're over there, you're bad. But that's not the way it works. The way it works is there's some small percentage, 10 or 15%, that we can all agree is good. And there's some small percentage, 10 or 15%, that we can all agree are bad by some standard that we can all agree on. But the vast majority of things don't fall into either of those camps. So our public policy issue becomes, what do we do with the vast majority of stuff that is neither clearly, bad, clearly good nor clearly bad? This is a dualistic problem that we're trying to deal with. And um, most of the political battles end up being the, at the margins of those two lines. We want to put more things in the bad category and more things in the good category. But the real question is, what do you do about all this stuff we don't know about? And not only don't we know about it, but some things are bad for some people and good for other people. They're not only good, but essential. Some things that are essential for some people are deadly to other people. Which category do you put those in? That much of the battle, including the vaccine issues you heard earlier, that we're in, into this, in this culture, is shaped by the fact that we divide everything into these two categories. We make the argument that anything that falls in the natural health category should be treated as if it's not bad, but the things that fall into the category of um, the pharmaceutical industry, which are inherently dangerous, should fall into the category of not good. So they're going to have to be shown that there's a benefit-risk uh, uh, equation that allows them to be useful. But you don't need to do that for food, for example, and other things that have what I call the natural food component. Now, that's a much more complex discussion. We can have it in the, the questions this, this afternoon. But I just want to get the thought out there. The second thing that we do that is a, is a, is a, a thinking process that drives our way of our, our whole culture is the notion of cause and effect. This causes that. And we get all hung up on that cause and effect issue. And you heard in the uh, talk about vaccines that uh, the notion of identifying a specific effect that you want to create by a specific cause causes you not to look at the large picture of what, you're ha what impact you're having. And I suggest that we really need to look carefully at that cause and effect uh, framework. Um, for, for years, 50 years at least, maybe 100, the argument was we cannot prove that smoking causes cancer. And uh, that's true. Because we put this straitjacket over things that says if it doesn't, if we don't know the mechanism of action and if we don't know the active ingredient, we can't actually establish a cause. And we do that for our entire regulatory process, not only in the food and drug area, but in all kinds of other areas as well. That cause and effect dynamic causes, leads us to doing the kinds of things we heard about with vaccines this morning. But it's true with all the pharmaceuticals. They all tend to be targeted toward a specific thing based on some kind of very, very narrow study. 
And uh, we've, we've ended up, again, when I was doing, uh, when we were doing the Chemical Feast, uh, one of the things that was interesting, that was only, uh, we started that book uh, only uh, about, just about five years after Rachel Carson and Silent Spring. And people seem to forget that the message of, the, of Silent Spring was that the interaction of all these different pesticides, of which there are now thousands, the interaction, the synergy, the dynamic between them is what's causing the problem. And yet, when we went and talked to FDA then, and we talked to FDA now, and we talked to NIH or EPA or any other regulator, they do not have any capacity to examine the synergy between the chemicals that are being poured into the environment, and poured into our bodies, poured into our lives. They do not even pretend to do that. What they look at is the specifics of a particular chemical. And the chemicals are treated almost as if they had their own civil rights. If you can't prove them guilty, then we're going to treat them as innocent, one by one. And you totally miss the point that was presented about vaccines in our earlier, uh, earlier talk. Then there's, a, there's a, um, uh, another concept that follows with these that is, is difficult to, it, it, it sort of flows from those two, dualism and cause and effect. We want to look at a, we want to look at a spectrum in almost every issue. The one I found when we were doing the chemical feast was this fantastic thing that goes on at the, uh, the National, uh, at the um, uh, National Academy of Sciences every five years when they redo the so-called RDA, Recommended Dietary Allowances, or in another form, Recommended Daily Allowances for Nutrients. It's a fascinating thing to watch. Because in the world that this operates out of, this is that rule world that is, a limit, is separated from reality by a bunch of beliefs that have been formed in various kinds of cultural ways. In that realm of the uh, writing of rules, and the rules that are being written here are uh, how, how much of each kind of nutrient is essential. At that time, there were about 21 essential nutrients that they wrote numbers for. There, there were probably upwards of 50 nutrients that are essential now, probably more. That is that we know. Remember, we shine the light on them so we know they're essential. We assume that the ones we haven't shined the light on aren't essential until we can bring them in there. Once you discover a nutrient that you didn't think was essential before is, in fact, essential. That doesn't mean it wasn't essential before. But that's the way they treat it. OK, so in that little world, the NIH gives them a few million dollar grant to go have meetings somewhat like this, only smaller, where they discuss their science and put their slides up and do all their stuff, and they debate. What's essential, what's not essential, how much, how do we do it? They do that from animal studies in large part, and it's from some human studies, and they come up with numbers. But what's interesting is that that world has two political groups in it. One group says what's essential is that which eliminates clinical disease. You need to have this much of vitamin C to get rid of, of scurvy and then whatever for beriberi and kwashiorkor and so forth. The number of the essential nutrients is the number necessary to treat or prevent clinical disease. That's team A. Team B is another team which says, no, 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 that's not right. What's essential is what healthy people eat. What you look, you go out and you look, what do people eat? And then you say, now the, a good nutritional diet has this much nutrients in it. And they fight. <laughs> and sometimes this team's in charge. And sometimes this team's in charge. Sometimes by one or two votes in the committee. 20 people or so. And so we're the public and we're sitting out here and we see on a headline. The authorities today change the amount of vitamin C that's necessary for the individual or essential for the individual from 120 milligrams a day to 60 milligrams a day. 
And everybody thinks, well, gee, some new science, some new information, something. But really, just another political team got control. <laughs> That's how the things up here get distorted from the things down here. Um, when Dr. Moshkowitz finished, he was talking about vaccines being perhaps the most counterproductive health program we have. And it is certainly a dangerous program in its own way. And, and there are a lot of, and, and I'll give you a summary line that I use about that. But the food program is just as bad in its own way. You're, we're ending up with a nutrient prescription by society that does not track what it is that people need. And in, worse than the specifics that I've just told you is the fact that very likely everybody's nutritional uh, profile is as unique to them as their fingerprints are. Biochemical individuality. Roger Williams was a member of the National Academy of Sciences, probably the most accomplished nutritionist of his generation, who put a lot of information out about biochemical individuality. It's being reissued now. You can get it on the, on the uh, internet, find the book, and find the information, find some updates. And he put it out about 1950, about 1950. And he put it in a popular form in 1957. And I was very fortunate to meet him uh, in the 70s when we were doing the chemical feast. And one of the things that he said, which was fascinating, I thought very much on point, is that in just about any other scientific field, an idea of that magnitude would have received some kind of research by somebody. But nobody had followed up what he had opened up as a, as a line of thinking on the nutritional question. And again, I believe that the reason for that is these, this kind of intellectual straitjacket that we're all locked into by the way that we think. When we get to the mercury issue, I find the same kind of dynamic. I um, got involved a little bit with, the, uh, with Dr. Molyneux's case in, uh, in Massachusetts. And uh, Again, it's really uh, difficult but important to understand how alienated the systems that we are operating in are from the people who are being affected by and affecting those systems. So here's a situation in which a vice president of Colgate got worried about fluoride. He retired and went to work as a dean of the, med of the dental school that was related to Harvard. And he brought in uh, the scientist who uh, had some research to do. She did her research on a grant from the, from the National Institutes of Health. The research was very, um, very uh, damning of fluoride. Um, it talked about how uh, the pituitary picked up um, pieces of fluoride and affected all bodily functions. This was all put together and totally the establishment process way. The direct result of that was the grant was withdrawn, the woman scientist was fired, and the dean was relieved of his duties. They didn't follow up the science. She went to court, and uh, she went to court being fired for, uh, she said she was fired as a matter of discrimination against an older woman, and that was the lawsuit that they brought. In the court, the, uh, her lawyers wanted to raise the scientific questions that she'd been involved in as a part of the case, and the uh, lawyers for the university tried to block that, said this is, you know, science is way too difficult and complicated and not relevant and you shouldn't use it and so forth. And the judge says, no, no I, I, I studied, uh, I got a, an advanced degree in science at Harvard before I went into law school, and I'd really like to hear what the science is. <laughs> and right after that, they had a big settlement. She got paid something we don't know how much, but she got happy and went away, and that was the end of that case. But the information that's out there was never pursued. So, again, what I'm saying is there is a strategic context for these battles that we're having. And the way the society has structured itself is to uh, create um, a line of one kind or another, which you're allowed to be inside of, and then you're okay, and if you're outside of that, you're bad. You've heard about the scientists that are being pushed out as pariahs. 
Wakefield's right in the middle of that right now. I mean, not only did they, not only did they withdraw the, withdraw the uh, study from the Lancet, but they defamed him essentially in uh, his integrity as a part of doing that. Uh, and almost simultaneously, uh, within you know, just a few weeks, uh, the dozens of autism cases that were going through the vaccine uh, board were all rejected. And uh, there were attacks on uh, uh, Operation, uh, the, um, the uh, Jenny McCarthy group that does vaccine campaigning. It was like a huge coordinated effort in the vaccine world. And these happen all the time, all over the place. And if you're not aware that that's what's going on, you think, well, gee, that's interesting. I guess that guy didn't put his state out right. Interestingly enough, within two weeks, the number one scientist that uh, CDC relies on to refute the vaccine autism connection absconded with $2 million from his university and uh, is on the run somewhere at this point. And uh, every one of their studies that they looked at is now being re-looked at and saying, wait a minute, maybe this wasn't quite right. He got over just about $50 million worth of sole source grants, sole, sole source grants from CDC to prove that there's no connection between mercury and autism. There is a tendency for a group like this to think that these battles are scientific battles. And they are absolutely partially scientific. You can't have this battle without having science. Science is necessary, but it's not sufficient because these are political battles. And so here you have this situation going on, which happens over and over in, uh, how are we doing on time? Over and over on um, uh, various of these kinds of issues. Um, so what I've been trying to do, when, when I started out with Nader, my point with Nader was, look, it's not going to help to try to get better cars because better cars are a symptom of a better system. Bad cars are a symptom of a, of a bad system. So what we need to do is think about how, we, how do we approach this thing systemically? How do we think about this, the structure? And so I argue that any time one takes on one of these battles, that we do it specifically on the narrow hand-to-hand -hand combat around the battle, and also strategically in the total framework. In the Mercury area, I can remember Sam Ziff called me in 1967, and, I'm sorry, 1987, and said, here's what the ADA is doing. I said, well, you can't do that. <laughs> Just, you know, a lawyer looks at what the ADA is doing and says, hey, this is, not, this is not reasonable. This is not defendable. You can't tell people that they can't have a communication about Mercury. Can't be done. And we started a campaign. I got the the local started to lay up the framework for a campaign. I got the local uh, former head of the ACLU in Washington to go over the uh, whole issue. And we came up with a legal strategy. In this is in 1987. Um, and unfortunately, it was in the early part of 87. And Sam was going to put the money up or get the money, or he had all worked out. And then on October 24th, 1987, the stock market crashed. And I can remember Sam calling me and saying, whoops, we don't have the money anymore. So then we started on a different strategy. And uh, 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 that strategy is uh, illustrative of the kind of strategic approach I like to make on all kinds of issues. First of all, I think to win an issue like vaccines, mercury, natural foods, it has to be they're, they're out in front of the demand of the society changing needs to be the consumers, the people who are going to use these products and services. That's every one of us. But that's how you have to push it. You have to say, look, it's in the interest of the people who are getting fillings that they understand the to total reality about mercury versus other fillings and that they have the right to make that choice and they be fully informed. It has to be about them. Too often these issues get pushed back to it's the right of the person who is providing the service to provide the service. No doubt about it. That's true. But that right cuts much less deeply than the right of the individual to hear the information and be able to make the choice. I, uh, when I, uh, I've, I've been doing activism for, you know, for as long as I can remember, I think like I was, when I was five, but I can remember when I was an undergraduate uh, student at Ohio State, we had a free speech movement before Berkeley. It was very interesting because Ohio's not, a blue state. I mean, it's a very, you know, at best, 
it's a, it goes back and forth. But it's conservative, it's very conservative. And we had a, a complete gag rule. I mean, they banned Hubert Humphrey from speaking on our campus in 1960. Too controversial. Um, and we didn't like that. And so the students organized a campaign. And what we did is our campaign was about not the right of the speaker to speak. It was about the right of the students to hear. And one of the leaders, uh, after I left, one of the leaders that had worked on our campaign devised a situation in which they invited a guy who was a professor at Berkeley, uh, I believe it was Berkeley, uh, Herbert Apthecker, who was a known Marxist, to come and speak on the campus and he was banned. And so what they did is they had him come and stand at the platform, but not speak. And they had another podium over there and they got Ohio State uh, political science and history professors, one after another, to read from Apthecker's books that were taken from the Ohio State Library. 75% <laughs> of the newspapers in Ohio editorialized for eliminating the gag rule. And it was gone very quickly. We didn't have the violence at that point. We did later on the campus. But at that point, that was handled in that way. Now, We've had some things like that that have worked in the areas that I'm talking about here. So for example, I start out with push the consumers out in front. They, this is their issue. This is what is best for them. Then my, my, my belief is there needs to be something to be for. It's not so much being against mercury as for choice of fillings. It's much easier, and the public can hear much more openly an argument for something than they can an argument against something. So if you say we're for, and then figure out what you're for. So we had this situation where uh, we were trying to figure out how to deal with the food industry being so repressive. Um, and the government being an ally of the food industry being so repressive. And lo and behold, the Federal Trade Commission proposes a rule that says the words natural, organic, and health food should be banned from all commerce, 1975. Now, you got to, who thinks up things like that? <laughs> then I, I talked to, I, mean, we, I was a lawyer for five consumer groups, as were, there were many industry groups and sort of fighting that, I mean, many other parts of that rule, but that was what we were fighting. And I talked to the lawyer from the FTC on the other side, and I said, you know, those words, those three words are written on the front windows of thousands of stores across America. How are you going to enforce it? And he said, I think he was joking, he said, well, maybe we'll just have tanks go up and down the street and shoot the windows out. <laughs> <laughs> you get some idea of how the... I like to say to people that however bad you think it is, it's at least 100 times worse. <laughs> And these are the people that make the rules. So I'm arguing you need to be for something. Now, there are three components of what for has to consist of, I think. I mean, this is my strategic approach. One is you have to have something at the point of purchase that is as good as, as, good as whatever it is that's out there. And by as good, I mean it does the same job, and it does it at the same or better price. It does the same or better job at the same or better price, and, you're, and that's a good thing. Secondly, you have to have a way of distributing it that is not locked into the current distribution system, whatever it is you're dealing with. Uh, we worked a lot, because I'm open to all kinds of opportunities, and we worked a lot to try to get organic food into uh, supermarkets. Couldn't be done. It couldn't be done because it's a structural problem. If every American got up tomorrow and went out to buy organic food, all the organic food in America would be bought, gone 10 minutes after the stores opened. Because there's a teeny weeny little bit, about 4% of the whole food supply. So th there are some problems there. Then gradually a, you know, a distribution system started to develop. And uh, you know, a structural problem would be, for example, uh, most of the wheat, about 50% of the wheat grown in the country meets the organic food standards just because of the way it's done. They don't spray it and they don't use fertilizer on it and so forth. But when it's harvested, it's taken right to the same grain elevator as the non-organic and dumped right in and it loses its differentiation. It's a commodity. But if you had changed that structure and had one set of 
green elevators that was organic and one set that wasn't, you could actually have a really, a really vigorous activity in organic rain. But we, we don't do that. But nonetheless, a distribution system is very important. You've got to have you got to have people who you can identify and say, we deliver the thing that you want. And the third thing that's crucial in what you want is an idea system, a framework, a reason. Why is this better? And you know, people can learn, people can understand, people can grasp that sort of thing. And you know, why is this better becomes something they all talk about and work on and so forth. And you know, I go through, I, I, when I, I said before I was going to give you my bottom line on vaccination. I, you've got to actually be pretty, you got to be pretty coarse as a culture to say we're going to require every child to take a product that we know will kill some of them. The government's totally on record. Some kids are going to be killed by these vaccines, no doubt about it. Another bunch are going to be maimed, no doubt about it. We've paid over $2 billion in money to individuals whose family member has either been killed or maimed by vaccines, $2 billion. We know that's going to happen, but that's just the cost of being an American in this century. Well, that's not a moral position. And we will not be able to sustain ourselves with those kinds of moral positions. And they're all around us all the time because the only way that line that separates good from bad can be maintained is by force. That's what the government does. It brings force down. And when you are told you must take a vaccine, believe it, it's, that is a, that's an exercise of force. The issue on uh, the mercury, in, vac uh, mercury in, uh, in dental fillings is not quite as much force, but close. And when you get to the food additive issue, the bill pending right now, Senate 510, will just really reinforce the notion of how much the food can be debased with the government standing by and helping. Um, now, the only antidote to all of that that I see is an organized, informed public saying, wait a minute. And we need to be really careful as our team goes on the field not to step all over each other. Because the data shows that when the vaccines uh, went up in the uh, number that were given, the diseases that we were talking about also went up. But also at that time, there were four or five major changes made in the food supply so that the food safety advocates are going around saying the food's the thing that did it. Fructose, uh, a series of different formulations, uh, the, the kind of economics that, that works on, um, on products has created food that actually, in their argument, is causing the same things, autism and all of the other things. Now, we have to be really careful about getting trapped into that cause and effect argument where somebody says, no, no, it's the vaccines, or no, no, it's the food. Uh, uh we've got this generic framework that we have to be th thinking about. Dr. Moscow has talked about. All of these things are working together to create the kind of problems we have. And what are those problems? The United States is uh, 37th in healthcare in the world. It's about 25th or 26th in life expectancy. It's about 40th in maternal deaths at birth. Maternal deaths at birth. 39 countries in the world have better records on that than we do. Every decade of Americans dies sooner than at least 10 other countries, and in some instances, 60 or 70 other countries. We have a lousy health care profile. It's really a problem. Now, you all saw what happened when the financial system collapsed back a year ago or so. Terror and problems. Well, the health system's collapsing the same way. And in fact, they're interconnected. Because these bad things that I just described to you from health are running up health costs. And one of the main things that drove General Motors into bankruptcy was the $3,000 or so that they have to pay in, on every car for health care. That entire stuff is all woven together. And the whole thing's coming apart. <laughs> At the core of the, you know, the resolution of that is that the public needs to get itself informed and involved, and we need to separate a bunch of those structural problems that make that not happen. And so now we're getting into the close. It's five more minutes, and I want to just give you a little bit of a way of thinking about this. Um, we've got to not, we've got to avoid 
separating things into causes and effects and start thinking how do we integrate things. How do we integrate our view of reality? How do we integrate all the stuff we see and not be so sure that this caused that, but see, mm, these things are occurring together. I wonder what's the dynamic that causes these things to occur together? Now, one of the things that goes on in the natural health world is this concept of the innate intelligence of the body. The body has the ability to correct itself. That's what you heard from Dr. Moskowitz. We've heard it from people yesterday. And a lot of what the natural health movement is doing is removing things that interfere with the natural ability of the body to help cure itself or treat itself and to provide things that help the body do that. And that's where the whole argument for homeopathy comes from. I think there's another idea that's very, very important, and that is the innate intelligence of the body politic. Absolutely tracking the same kinds of things that we find in the body itself. There are places where you can intervene and you can do a homeopathic treatment on the body politic, and things all of a sudden happen. We were able to defeat that organic food rule and gradually over the next 15 years worked and worked and worked until organic food became national policy. It's part of the national agricultural policy as of 1990. I, looked and I, I was looking for what we could do in food that would be, meet my criteria. Good at the point of purchase, different distribution system, and a good idea system. And what I came up with was biodynamic food, and you want to look at that. Just, just uh, Google it. But it didn't have a distribution system. But it provides beautiful products, and it has huge ideas, but no distribution system. So we had to back off to organic and push that particular part of the battle forward on organic. And I worked really hard and helped lobby that through, and I'm very, it was very successful, and now we have to fight to maintain and expand what organic is. That was done without a huge, you know, there wasn't a lot of people, you know, the careers were destroyed and a lot of people undermined and so forth by that battle. When I looked over at the drug side of FDA, which I started with vaccines, I said, there's gotta be something like this for drugs. And I, and I ultimately, I thought, by, I thought homeopathy would be it, but even though it's got great ideas and a terrific product that it delivers at the end, no distribution system. But acupuncture did have it. Terrific product, great ideas, and a distribution system. And we worked quietly and carefully and de developed, and I was on the, uh, the uh, board that certified acupuncturists for 11 years. We've laid a whole criteria for how they're gonna proceed. And in 1996, FDA approved acupuncture needles as safe and effective. Believe that. Before 1996, FDA said, acupuncture needles are illegal in America. Think about that. And now there's a battle you don't even know took place. But the one thing I had to do that was the, I think, reason that we were able to win was keep the acupuncture world quiet because it took them, instead of the six months they're supposed to make a decision, it took them two and a half years, and the acupuncture world was going to go pick at the FDA and do all kinds of things, which I thought would have made it impossible to pass this thing, and I was talking to the FDA on a regular basis, and I knew what the problems were inside, and ultimately, they did come out with this rule. And now acupuncture is considered, you know, essentially okay. It's, you know, nobody gets, gets mad at it. They had good science, they had good, uh, you know, good pra practitioners, good deliverers. Now, what I'm saying is you need to think about that approach in every issue. We do not think spectrums are the way we do it. We think you want to use a matrix. We have a very broad matrix that we use, which is left, right, order, free, freedom, order. And everybody fits on that met 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 uh, matrix one way or another on every issue. It's not left, right. Not, pro, not um, Democrats and Republicans and so forth. It's basically, most of the battles are the freedom side and the order side trying to come up with some kind of integrated way to create rules that reflect reality. I have to stop. Uh, but I want to tell you that I do have a book called <laughs> The Voice of the People, The Transpartisan Imperative in American Life, written by myself and a conservative, saying, let's stop this set of thinking that we're talking about here that I've been discussing with you, and let's start to um, think about things differently. And I'm urging that in the, you know, all the areas that you guys work in, starting with mercury dentistry, but, but all the natural health areas lend themselves to being looked at um, as beyond left and right, as transpartisan, as issues where all of the people can get together and figure out what are the answers to all of these problems. And uh, they're, you know, they're pretty tough, intractable political problems that can be addressed. And the science helps. It's not sufficient. Thank you very much.